capabilities and features. Uh, Dr. Jose, please go ahead and start your presentation. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Ganesham. Thanks for inviting me and for this opportunity to uh, to talk about Power uh, uh, Ten today. I uh, can people hear me okay, and can you see uh, my slides? Yeah, looks good. Uh, looks good. You, okay. Yeah. Now, yeah, it's in presentation mode. Looks good. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so that it's working. Thank you very much, Ganesh, and again, I'm uh, really uh, very happy to be able to talk about Power10, which is the latest uh, member of the IBM Power family. Uh, now, I uh, I'm actually have been a user of, of all of them. I started using what it was called the RT6000 uh, way back. I was in, in, in school and uh, we had workstations with IBM RT, and then uh, you know, when I came to IBM, I started working on Power 1, Power 2, and uh, you know, more of us a user. Um, but for the past few generations, I've actually worked on the on the processor development. This is the work of a tremendous team. I'm, I'm, I'm in research, so my, my contribution is more on exploring uh, different directions, uh, you know, future directions. But I will talk about you know, Power 10 as, as it's available today. And um, uh, some uh, and and some some of the things I have contributed, I can talk more. Other things I haven't really contributed, but I, I know about them. But I'll ask you know everybody to be um, uh, interactive and ask questions. No, I will. Uh, um, I, I I have a a bit of material here, but I will I will manage the time because I do want to have a discussion. So I will I will cover a broad. Um, uh, spectrum of the capabilities and features of Power 10, uh, but I, uh, I do want to leave enough time uh, at the end and even during the talk for people to ask questions because it's really that way I know what you're interested in and I can you know, uh, uh, tailor my answers to, to your interest. So let's talk about the key features of the Power 10 chip, the, uh, the hardware that actually is the foundation of Power 10 systems. This is a um, a processor chip with 600 uh, square millimeters. Uh, so it's it's big and we can actually make packages with multiple chips in a single module. So we'll talk about that, that later. Uh, uses an 18 layer metal, uh, 18 layers of metal. So it's a very uh, interconnected chip. And this is really part of uh, what makes it a, uh, a really superior server chip. Um, we um, uh, the, the 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 chip itself, if you uh, is built around about half of the area of the chip. This 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 inside here is the processing complex, the cores. Uh, there are on, in the in the hardware sixteen of these SMT eight core units. Um, fifteen of those can be active, so there are fifteen at most fifteen SMT eight cores. Uh, active on the chip, they, the cores actually behave as each, each SMT8 core believes as two independent SMT4 cores. So you can also count this as a 30 SMT core chip. Um, uh, either way, you have 120 hardware threads on a single chip. So you can have up to 120 virtual processors on a single chip. And as I mentioned, we do have dual chip modules. Oops, uh, this, is, uh, this is some uh, timer, a kind of timer. Um, I don't know why, sorry. Just a moment. Let's, let's try again. So the, um, uh, the um, uh, in the dual chip module, we end up packing 240 uh, hardware threads, no virtual processors on a single uh, on a single module. Um, this, so like I said, the processors are in the middle of the chip. The uh, periphery of the chip is all the interconnect. Um, it's sometimes hard to tell, but it's more more about half and half. So half of the area is the processing complex, and half of the area is the interconnect complex. And this interconnect complex is uh, really key to building very powerful systems. And I'll talk about everything that the interconnect can do um, in, in, in the next slide. 
uh, but uh, the interconnect means both the memory interface. We have a full terabyte per second of memory interface. We have an additional terabyte per second of interface to other chips, other components of the system. So two terabytes per second total from the chip plus I.O. So uh, like you know, connection to, uh, to I.O. devices, network cards, that's an, an additional uh, significant bandwidth. So the, the chip has a tremendous amount of bandwidth within the chip and going outside the chip. Um, we have integrated AI acceleration hardware. That is something that I actually worked on and I can talk in more detail. We have a new matrix unit, part of every core, every power 10 core has a, a new matrix unit that is meant to, uh, to accelerate uh, HPC and machine learning and uh, deep learning applications. We have significant security features, including encrypted memory, return-oriented programming protection, and we have completely re-architected the microarchitecture to deliver more power more efficiently. So we have essentially a, 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 about a 3x advantage in power and aggregate power throughput um, and, and in, 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 in power per, uh, in, in performance per uh, electrical power um, uh, throughput. If you compare the, the, the DCM, right? The power, the power 10 DCM versus the power nine largest chips of largest module to largest module. It's essentially a three X improvement in, um, in performance and efficiency. Um, so I, I, I did not tell I'm going to talk about the interconnects. So the power 10 chip has um, a terabyte per second of bandwidth to memory. That's throughout what we call our open um, uh, memory interface. It's, a, it's an open standard that IBM developed with the rest of the industry. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an alternative to let's say the DDR standard, but it, it's actually something that complements the DDR standard. I'll show I'll show how. how. Uh, and this uh, open memory uh, interface in Power 10 has a full terabyte per second of bandwidth, and you can use it to connect to conventional you know, DDR, uh, but you can also uh, connect to uh, uh, high bandwidth memory uh, or to storage class memory. So it's a, it's, it's a standard interface and what you put on the other end, it's up to you. Um, we also, like I said, we have a terabyte per second in the power axon interconnect, which is our system interconnect. So you can use that terabyte per second, for example, to connect multiple chips. I show here in, um, uh, I'll get my, yeah. Uh, so shown here is a 16, uh, single chip module system. That's the largest uh, uh, shared memory processor that we can build. And the, the system is all, the, the chips are all interconnected using the power axon. Uh, but the same power axon can use to attach uh, coherent uh, interfaces. So if you have an accelerator card or a network card or an IO card that uses our open CAPI, which is another open standard developed by IBM, um, that uh, net, th those, those extension cards can attach coherently to the memory system. And then finally, power axon can also be used to build clusters of machines that share memory. Uh, that's our memory inception technology. I'll talk ex explicitly about there um, soon, but this is a, a very big innovation of Power 10 that allows us to build very large memory systems up to two petabytes of memory that is directly addressable by a processor. So a processor or a thread running on a processor can access two petabytes of memory uh, doing direct loads and stores. So this is, this is and, and then of course I did mention that on, on top of those two terabytes per second or one terabyte per memory, one terabyte for system interconnect, we have additional bandwidth, significant uh, bandwidth to the IO through PCIe Gen 5 uh, uh, interconnect. So it's a, uh, it's a chip, again, I want to emphasize a lot of connections within the chip and a lot of connections to the chip to you know, the rest of the, the system. Um, 
before I go on, um, I'm, not, I'm gonna start, to, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the memory aspects um, um, and, and, and then about the system aspects. Any, any questions so far? Does anybody want to ask a question? I see there's things in the chat. Is there anything for me? No, okay. Okay, so then let's go to the, um, uh, let's skip a little bit here. I wanna talk about the, the memory because I did mention that we, uh, Power10 has this open memory interface and what you put on the other side uh, is up to you, but probably <laughs> the most important thing that you can put on, on the other side as the, are these memory gems, the op open memory interface uh, memory gems, which they are, um, uh, they come in different sizes. This is a uh, relatively small memory gem. It's actually smaller than a normal uh, DDR gem. Um, you can see that it has much fewer connectors because those connectors run at a much higher speed. They run at 32 giga transfers per second. And the connection actually goes to a buffer chip. You can see this case is a buffer chip developed by a partner, microchip. And this buffer chip then translates that OpenMI, uh, open memory interface to a plain DDR interface. So these memory chips that you see here are DDR chips. So this is a DDR memory but it talks to the processor over a buffer chip that converts the DDR protocol to the open memory interface. If I wanted to use a different kind of memory, in this case, this is a DDR4 memory. If I want to use a DDR5 memory or an HPM or a storage class memory, I would change the buffer chip and the, the memory chips and the interface here would be the same. Um, so we make, we make these cards in different sizes for the larger servers. You can have up to 256 gigabytes of memory in one card. Um, uh, and, and since a processor can talk to 16 cards through 16 channels, you can have up to four terabytes of memory per processor or 64 terabytes per 16 processor system. Um, yes. So let me let me spend some time now talking about the uh, other aspect of the uh, of the interconnect, which is the power axon that is used to connect um, uh, chips. So the the current power ten systems are all single chip module based. Uh, a single chip module, as the name says, has a single has a single chip in it. Um, it does have sixteen uh, memory interfaces, uh, open MI interface, open memory interfaces. And um, it also has the uh, links to connect to up to 16 of the single chip module uh, uh, together. This is a two hop connection. You can see here a single chip is connected to, two, uh, to three other chips on the same node. Direct, there are direct connections. So you see this, this chip here has three connections, one, two and three to the different chips in the same node. And then they also connect across nodes uh, um, uh, using these vertical connections, which are also direct. So you, you can get to any, uh, from one chip in the system to any chip in the system in two hops. So for example, if I wanna go from the upper left to the lower right, I could use a blue link, a horizontal link to go to this uh, chip here, and then a vertical link to go to this chip. And then, uh, so I have a, a full connectivity in two hops up to 16 uh, single chip modules. That's the largest system we, we have today, 16 chip modules, 16 single chip modules. And um, sometime uh, in the first half of next year, we'll be introducing our dual chip module. So the dual chip module, as the name says, has two chips in the same module. So it's a, it's a unit. Um, it, it's, it has twice the number of cores. It has the same memory bandwidth. So the, you, you give up some memory bandwidth per core because you have twice as many cores with the same uh, bandwidth, but you get more throughput because you just have more uh, course to do the work. Uh, in this case, you'll be able to build systems with up to four dual chip um, uh, modules, and they're all all to all connect. So this dual chip module here on the upper uh, left corner is connected to the other three with direct links. Uh, so very uh, tight integration, uh, very dense computing, a lot of compute power per socket. Um, and uh, uh, no, lots of lots of cores, lots of uh, memory bandwidth, and, and all that. 
So those are the kinds of uh, systems that, that we can build. The, the, the single chip module systems are available today. The dual chip module will be available in the first half of next year. Um, any questions so far? Okay, let me move on. To, I, I, I said I would talk more about memory inception and, uh, and I do um, want to spend some time here because this really is a big innovation for, uh, for Power 10. Memory inception is our first, uh, to, to, to our knowledge, the first implementation of a distributed uh, of a distributed memory disaggregation solution, meaning a uh, processor is no longer bound to use only the memory that is attached to itself or in the same uh, server. Right? We can have a, in this case, a cluster of servers. I show here uh, eight different servers. Uh, these are independent machines. They each run their own operating system. They each you know, behave as an independent machine. They each have their own memory. In this case, I show each one as having a collection of eight uh, uh, memory DIMMs per machine. And no, the, the actual number would be higher, but for illustration purposes, this place. And I have, I'm um, just showing the first three machines, each one using a, a, running a different workload. So workload A, B, and C. And I, I show all the different uh, memory configurations that can be achieved with memory inception. So for example, the simplest case, I have workload A running on a server and it's using memory in that server. So workload A uses um, uh, only the memory that is directly present in that server. And that's what you'd find in uh, most systems of, of today. But workload B, for example, which is running in a different server, um, if you notice, it has no memory in its own server. It's just borrowing memory uh, from different servers. So workload B is using memories from the top server and the one, two, three, four, uh, five other servers, um, completely remote. So it's a completely remote memory. The, the workload does not have to use memory in its own server, can use memory from any other server. So what this allows is the creation of a pool of memory, which can be extremely large because it's the aggregate memory of several servers. And now the workloads um, which run on a server can collect memory from different servers to build the amount of memory, the memory capacity that they actually need. Uh, and, and finally, to show the final configuration, workload C running on this server uses all its local memory, but that's not enough. So it also takes memory from other servers so it can build, you know, can build an, enough of a memory capacity to run uh, what it needs. Um, how, how it manages that uh, memory, it's, it's up to it, to, to itself, but it's all, it's all addressable memory. It's all, you know, you do a load, you do a store, just like any program will do. And if the memory is located on a remote server, the communication will go through the, um, uh, through the power axon links and bring the data back or store the data in the destination as if the memory were, were local. I guess, no, the, 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 the latency behavior is, is different. No, local memory is faster, um, but we have worked hard to make that difference as, uh, as, as small as possible. Um, um, so in terms of memory size, a single power 10 uh, entity uh, process, if you will, uh, can address up to two petabytes of memory. You, know, you can't fit two petabytes on a single machine. I you know the maximum you can fit is 64 terabytes. But if you have a cluster of those machines, you could have a single application using two petabytes of physical memory. Um, memory inception is, 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 available in the hardware, but we still have the, um, uh, we still have to do uh, um, uh, software support. So it's not something that you could you know, start using today, but you no, know, we are working with partners and hope to enable, you know, do the, the rest of the enablement soon and really open up the possibility for new applications and new usage models. Um, any, any questions so far? Okay. So I talked about the gains, uh, the gains in performance. So the uh, 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 if we if we consider our late previous processor, the Power Nine, um, as, as a reference performance of one in terms of, in terms of throughput, 
and we look at the performance of a power 10, uh, the, the larger power 10, the, the DCM uh, offering. Um, you can see that for a broad spectrum of applications, including integer, floating point, and commercial computing, enterprise computing, a, a single a Power 10 module can deliver three times the throughput of a Power 10 of the largest Power 9 module. In terms of memory bandwidth, we are currently with DDR4, which is the current offering, we're about a little bit better than 2x the um, uh, the memory bandwidth of Power9. So we achieve a little like around 400 uh, gigabytes per second bandwidth out of a single chip module or, or a dual, it's the same, a dual chip module also only has 16 um, uh, open MI, uh, open memory interface channel. Uh, but with DDR5 memory, which uh, no, we, we don't have yet, but it can be supported uh, in the future. I'm not, I'm not sure the, uh, the, the schedule or the plans for that, but we could get up to 800 um, gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth using DDR5 uh, memory, which again, I want to emphasize is not available today. The, the current offering is the DDR4 open memory interface memory. Um, because of some additional hardware that we did for HPC and uh, machine learning and deep learning, the improvements over Power9 are much higher for that class of applications. So for example, in Limpac, we can see a 10x improvement uh, module to module, power nine to power 10. Uh, on inference with ResNet 50 at single precision, it's also a 10x. Um, if we go to BFLOAT 16 and into 8, you know, the reduced precision inference, which is becoming more popular. Uh, again, we have additional hardware and the improvements over power nine can be 15x and even 20x. So this is because of the, um, uh, the new matrix unit, which is really optimized for those uh, um, those um, uh, computations. So think of the overall, no, the general improvement from P9 to P10 is about 3x for the targeted area of uh, uh, no, matrix computations, whether it be scientific computing or uh, machine learning or deep learning, it's, it's, it's more can be 10x uh, or, or, or and more 20x in reduced pursuit. Um, so we, um, um, uh, the the um, uh, the um, SMT8 core of Power 10 uh, is is significantly enhanced over Power 9. I think I'm gonna yes. I mean I think this is a better um, uh, a better slide here. It has more detail and it's also color coded. So when you see a box here in green, means we improved over uh, Power 9 by some degree. If it's a blue, it means we improved by at least 2x. And if it's red, like in the case of the matrix accelerator, we improved by at least 4x. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and Power9 did not have a matrix unit. So uh, you, you, what, what it means is that whatever this matrix unit can do, it does four, four times better than Power9 could do with it, uh, whatever it had its own vector instructions. And the general vector is 2x. Um, so what, uh, what what are the big big improvements over uh, Power9? The execution slices have been doubled in size. So Power9 had four execution slices of 64 bit wide. We have moved to four execution slices 128 bit wide. That's why our vector throughput went up to a factor of two. Uh, we used to have to do take pair two slices to do a vector unit. Now we can do four independent vector units, and we can really do four per cycle. Um, this is complemented by the matrix unit, which I, uh, I mentioned before, which there are two engines, each one capable of producing 512 bits of result. Um, the data cache has stayed at 32 kilobytes, uh, the, L2, the L1 data cache, the L1 instruction cache improved 50%, it's a 48 kilobyte. The L2 cache, which is common instruction on data, has improved significantly to a megabyte. It's a, it's a very big improvement. You know, uh, Power9 used to have a shared L2 cache per, uh, um, um, per SMT4 core with it. So only, you know, they effectively only had 256 kilobytes. So this is a full megabyte. Um, our translation uh, support, the TLB, improved by, by 4x. Uh, we do more prefetch. We can keep more instructions in flight. Um, our load queue, load miss queue, our instruction buffers, everything has been enhanced over Power9, resulting in a core 
that on average is, is 30% faster. Uh, we have more cores. So that's no, that's the other big uh, uh, improvement. So we went from a 24 core module max to a 60 core module max. So that that's a big improvement. So that's how we get the three X. Now much of it is from having more cores per module, but about 30% is the core being faster. And again, for um, the the matrix computation, the core is is four to five times faster. So big improvement there. Um, so let's talk a, a, a little bit about this new matrix unit, which is something that uh, no, that that I work very closely uh, uh, with, and this is you know, uh, work that we started in, in research and it was very successfully transferred to the product. Um, so you know, uh, the matrix unit, what it does, uh, we call it the MMA. Um, the matrix unit, it, it can perform operations on vectors, so it, it takes vectors from the, uh, the same vector scalar register file as the vector unit does, um, but the operation it does is an outer product. So it takes um, two vectors, let's say the X vector and the Y vector, each one here uh, with four single precision elements in this case, and it does uh, an all to all operation. So it takes one element of vector X multiplied by every element of vector Y and accumulates into a new register called the accumulator and uh, repeats that for each element of X, multiplying each element of X by all the elements of Y. So it really is an N square operation uh, using vectors as input and updating a new uh, matrix register that we call the accumulator. Um, so this is the, uh, to our knowledge, the first uh, CPU to have a matrix unit. Um, it, it won't be the last. In fact, next year, IBM will be introducing another processor of System Z also has a matrix unit. Uh, Intel has already announced a matrix unit for their machine next year. Um, and ARM has at least published the architecture of their matrix unit. So we, uh, but we are very proud to have been the first to market. Uh, Power 10 today, uh, no ships and, 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 and has this matrix unit enabled and working and we have software to use the compilers, uh, know about the matrix unit, our open BLAS, our ESSL, um, uh, um, the uh, tensor, uh, sorry, uh, Eigen uh, is another package. So we did all the work of enabling both IBM proprietary software uh, and open source software to uh, exploit this matrix unit. Um, like I said, also the matrix unit, I said, I think, um, uh, but let me see if I can wrap up in a few minutes to leave enough time for questions. But we, uh, the matrix units actually defines eight accumulators. So each one of these green uh, matrices here that I show is stored in one accumulator. There are eight of those. Um, the form of the operation, as I said, is a, um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, an outer product of two vectors. And we can operate on single precision data half precision uh, floating point data, could be BFLOAT 16 or IEEE 16 bit floating point. We can update on uh, uh, signed and unsigned integers of eight bits and 16 bits, single precision floating points, double precision floating point, and even four bit integers. So we do cover the wide spectrum of data types. Uh, we also now see that our uh, uh, our matrix unit not only was the first, but you know, we, we think it's the more complete um, uh, because it does cover the whole uh, spectrum of data types from double precision, uh, single precision, half precision, integers, no, 16, 18, 8 bit, and 4 bit integers. Um, just again to show the, the fundamental instruction is the outer product. So if you have a, a four element vector of single precision, you just do one, one, one um, outer product of two vectors and you update a 4 by 4 matrix. If your data type is 16 bit, then you treat each vector as actually two columns of four 16 bit elements each, right? So it's if 16 bit, then each column is 64 bit. So you treat the vector as having two columns of um, uh, four 16 bit elements or two rows of four 16 bit elements. Then you do two outer products and you update the matrix. Uh, if you have eight bit elements, you have a four by four matrix in each vector registers. You do actually do you do what is essentially a, a matrix product of two four by four matrix and update a, a destination matrix of four by four. 
And even in four bits, you have a four by eight matrix times an eight by four matrix and you update a four by four matrix. So the accumulator is always a four by four um, matrix of 32 bit elements, except for double precision. If it's double precision, then it's six by two um, matrix. Uh, and the input can be uh, vectors or matrices of 32 bit, uh, 16 bit, eight bit, four bit elements, or can be double precision as well. Um, uh, I, I mentioned that we have uh, 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 also delivered the libraries that, that use this, um, uh, this matrix unit. And for example, uh, we have also run a DGEM uh, benchmark um, and uh, an LIMPAC um, on, the, um, uh, on, on Power 10 using the matrix unit. So what this graph shows is for DGEM, the improvements over Power 9. So Power 9 is in green here. The orange is the power 10 using only the vector unit. Already shows a big gain of power nine expected because we have the, we have twice as much vector processing as power nine. So the fact that we do uh, twice uh, as we go from power nine to power 10, that's not a surprise, but more significant once we use the matrix unit, we got another factor that is more than double uh, the, the, the power 10. So uh, very significant gains from the matrix unit on power 10. Same thing with LIMPAC. Um, no, the LIMPAC on power 10 using only the vector units is the orange. It's, it's a, no, a little bit, maybe around 2x, maybe a little bit less than 2x over power 9. And then another 2x from using the matrix unit on LIMPAC. And our best run on a single chip module with LIMPAC is uh, here. This is 2.9 teraflops. So this is 2.9 teraflops out of a single chip module, CPU only code. It's uh, to the best of our knowledge, the best of single chip performance for a CPU. Um, we also have been extending working with collaborators outside IBM, in this case with Sharif, Yass Sharif Yassil, who is a student at the University of Illinois, who has used the, the matrix unit to do sparse matrix computation, something that you may not know what the first thing it can be done. No, it feels more like a dense math unit. But Sharif has um, uh, applied it to sparse computations. Uh, he gets speed ups. No, not, not for every matrix. No, most some some of the about half of the matrices don't see that much uh, difference because there are sparsity patterns to such that doesn't work. But for some matrices, we can see you no know, more than two, two and a half. Sometimes he even sees a three x speed up from using the matrix unit for sparse matrix computation. And uh, we were very happy to see one particular sparse matrix um, uh, times a dense matrix multiplied that got over a teraflop. So this is a code that you know, used to get a couple hundred gigaflops on power nine, got almost half a teraflop on power 10 using only the vector unit. But by using the matrix unit, we went over a teraflop on a sparse matrix code. So uh, let me conclude. I uh, just uh, spent half an hour here. So. Uh, uh, Power 10 is the latest generation of power systems. It's really meant for enterprise computing. Um, we delivered big improvements in compute, memory, and interconnect, uh, achieving more or less a threefold across the board improvement on socket performance um, uh, for a broad class of applications. Again, for the things that are more matrix oriented, including deep learning, we see more of a 10x improvement. Um, Memory, uh, we added more memory bandwidth and more vector processing because we know those are key for high performance computing. Memory inception is really opens the door uh, to a new class of flexible and extremely large memory systems. And uh, the, the new MMA facility, which is really our the first matrix unit in a, in a CPU, uh, really defines a new set of matrix math instructions that you know, opens a, a door for new. Uh, uh, new up, new applications at a new level of performance. And we have been able to achieve those new levels of performance, not only on the things that we were exclusively designed for, like deep learning, but also in, in, in sparse linear algebra with some big gains in performance from the matrix unit. So that concludes my talk. I'm uh, happy to uh, to take uh, no, uh, as, as many questions as uh, Ganesh wants. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Jose, uh, for the wonderful presentation also. Uh, talking about, you know, the power 10 features and advantages over, uh, you know, the other processors in the world. Uh, I have a question on the chat window. Uh, any specific area of AI for improvement power 10 system over power nine? Um, uh, yeah, so we, um, uh, we, we have been, um, 
focusing on uh, deep learning that was uh, you know, that was the motivation for having the reduced precision uh, support in power 10. So for example, B float 16, which is the 16 bit floating point, uh, not IEEE, it's, 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 a, uh, uh, it's, it's something that was proposed by, by other people, has become kind of the, uh, an important emerging uh, computation. So that's why you know, B float 16 was not supported before. And we added that support in power 10. Most of our customers actually today are more doing single precision with the traditional IEEE single precision. So we also uh, enhance that um, uh, performance. So we knew single precision was going to be probably the most important in the beginning and be float 16 more something looking forward as, as, as the industry evolves. Um, so those are... Uh, um, uh, right now, the main um, uh, precisions for uh, deep learning. Int 8 uh, may, may um, also turn out to be very important. I mean, there's a lot of focus on Int 8 computation. Uh, we already had Int 8 uh, vector instructions in Power 9, but we added the matrix support. Um, in terms of evaluation, we have focused on um, uh, ResNet as a benchmark. Uh, we have focused on BERT as, as a benchmark. And we see improvements that are uh, on a per core basis, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, with, with what we had expected, you know, three to four X, and then we have more cores. So it, it, it all looks like we, uh, we will have a 10 X improvement on uh, um, uh, module to module, power nine to power 10 for that class of deep learning. And even more, if we if we go to the reduced precision, right? So the 10x is if you keep the same precision, the, like for example, single precision, which is supported on both power nine and power 10. And then if you go to 16 bit uh, no, uh, floating point, which is not supported power nine, then, then we do get more because we can do larger models uh, at a reduced precision that power nine has to stay in single precision. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jose. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jose, uh, actually, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, uh, Jose, it, it was one of the very good session. Uh, the, the question I had is, like, uh, in Power 10, uh, you have been added a uh, few MMAs, right? Uh, and uh, I was uh, interested how it will affect the footprint, energy footprint compared to Power 9. Okay, so that's a, that's a that's a very good question. So the um, so every core has an MMA unit. I I, I don't think I have the drawing um, here. Let me take a look. But um, um, let me uh, let me share again. I'll, I'll do the best I can with uh, uh, with what I have here. But um, um, oh, maybe this. Yeah, it's it's here. So uh, so you you can see. I don't know if you can see here. This is the picture of an entire core, including the L2 cache. Okay, um, an SMT8 core. You see the uh, the MMAs here. So there are um, uh, this is an SMT8 core. So think as one half being an SMT4 core. The other half, the other SMT core, and each SMT4. Uh, core has its own MMA unit. So there are actually two here. I don't know if you can see the, in, in blue, there are two MMA units. So every, every SMT4 core has an MMA unit, but this MMA unit is power gated. So if you don't use it, because not every code has matrix computations, right? If you do a, uh, a, a traditional transaction processing or even a spec int, or you're running a Python code that does some, uh, you no. Know, general computation, it, it, it may not have any matrix computation. So the matrix units are power gated. So if you're not doing matrix computations, they don't, they don't uh, use anything. If you are doing matrix computations, they are more efficient than the vector unit. So the program actually runs with less power and faster. They, 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 um, they, they, they do more computation uh, and they are more efficient. Why are they power efficient? Because the 
uh, vectors, which are the inputs, come from the vector register, so that's the same as the vector unit. But the matrix, which is the big thing that gets updated, right? The matrix is n square, the vectors are n. Um, the matrix resides in the MMA. So the MMA has its own register file inside it, which has the matrices. So the matrices are kept local. The computation is local. Only the inputs come from the, you know, the, the, the general SIMD area, the vectors. So we actually transfer less data and are more efficient using the matrix unit than using the vector unit. Uh, say uh, that uh, generally in our normal uh, CPUs, we do have a frequency uh, burning, right? So we change the frequency yeah. based on that, which automatically nowadays operating system uh, take care of it. So you mean to say that we can actually programmatically, we have a control to switch on and switch off MMA. Is that so? Uh, uh, there is a programmatic control. It's, it's, it's internal. Uh, it's not done by the user. It's done by the, uh, the operating system or hypervisor. It's, uh, um, uh, uh, th th there is also a completely automatic uh, turn on. Like if you, use, if you use an MMA instruction, it just turns on, right? It has to. Because if your program has an MMA instruction, it has to work. So the turn on, let's say, is automatic. The turn off, there is a system software that monitors how long you have used the, uh, let's say, have used the MMA, and uh, or or it's it's a programmable hardware. You can program no, how long if you don't use the MMA, how long it shuts off, shuts down. Sorry. Okay. So it it has a it has a automatic turn on when you use, and it has a programmable turn off based on on how when was the last time you used it. So if you if you if you don't use it for a long time, it will turn off and it will not turn on again. But when you turn on it, when you use it, it turns on. There's a little hiccup there, right? It does take a little bit of time to turn on, but then it stays on. I mean, there's enough hysteresis that it it has not been a problem. Um, and I forgot the default configuration of how long, you know, how long before it turns off. But there is there is enough hysteresis that, uh, you know, for example, my 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 uh, link pack code here, right? So I wrote this link pack code. I, I never worry. I mean, I just use MMA. Maybe the first time it turns on, but then then it doesn't turn off because link pack is always doing matrix computation, right? So it stays on all the time. And then when I'm done with the benchmark after a while, nobody's using them. It turns off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, other question I had was uh, like you was you were ta you were talking about uh, a memory distributed memory sharing, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, in that case, in your case, it is a homogeneous systems, right? Every every cluster, every server, uh, yeah, everything is running uh, power uh, uh, ten. Uh, how about the case when do uh, when I have, do have a mix of uh, power nine and power ten? Because in a data center, it's common, right? We cannot uh, throw away yeah. the old systems like that. So if I able to build that cluster with my legacy systems, how does this uh, the memory uh, how does this memory inception still work? Is it allowed or should yeah. it come up with our middleware or so? Just I'm curious on that aspect. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good question. So memory inception was only introduced in Power Ten. So it may be that going forward, like if you have a Power Ten, Power Eleven systems, maybe we can make it operate. I'm not sure what the plan is there, but today. You can only do memory inception, power 10 to power 10. They don't have to be the same power 10 model. I mean, because we have the, I, I drew like, the, let's say our dense servers here, you could have the larger servers. So you could have a heterogeneous power 10. I don't know if you call them heterogeneous because they're all power 10, but you could have like one system with a lot of memory and many systems with small memory and they can all you know, pull, use the memory of the big system if you want. So it can be heterogeneous on power 10, but today it's, it's only power 10, yes. I was just curious because uh, we do have, uh, because uh, even uh, in our lab we have power nine and uh, if we get, uh, and uh, it is uh, very tough to get uh, one power nine systems itself. So when we get the power 10, right? So somehow we should uh, thought, okay, 
uh, why can uh, how can we actually make it work uh, uh, exploit this uh, inception so that's that's the reason i just wanted to check with you well i mean i think that's very good input going forward right when we do power 11 we you know should we consider making memory inception uh, portable across and you know your your comment makes me think we should and i you know need to see what what the plan is for that also no i just i want to emphasize again i want to keep you know memory inception like the hardware is there we built the hardware in power 10 but we don't have the software enablement yet so we're we're working with some partners to get that enabled so uh who know I, I can't give you a date right i can tell you well next year we're going to have a memory inception working or maybe because it, it really depends on the engagement with the partners um but i think at this point it's really a, a software note the hardware is there power 10 was built with memory inception this is just we need it's just just software but no software is a lot of work too so yeah 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 i do understand yeah, yeah. Uh, so probably if, uh, if you guys open up some kind of apis or something so that would be easy for uh, uh, us to develop uh, a, uh, a middleware to uh, to work seamlessly at least so yeah no i think that's i think that's a good um, um uh, a good point and that could be you know maybe some some joint work would be done developing a, 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 an api for uh, for applications to specify and use memory inception right we yeah. also know it also needs cabling right that's you know i should say <laughs> um so today um these these cables here need to be uh no this cabling is not something that you get today i mean if you buy if you buy eight even if you were to buy eight power 10 systems they would not come with the cabling so that's another thing we have to do is provide the cabling and then provide the software that uh, that, that can use that but so this is this is work i mean we, we are we would like to work with people that that are interested in memory inception that can help us know uh, give uh, guidance to what's the what should be our priorities what should be future developments and all that because we think it's a very you know it's a very um, uh, exciting technology that really opens the door to new things because i see uh, I, i being myself a researcher i could see that uh, the future is hpc and ai so when we do have lot of workload especially in the cloud cloud is give, uh, cloud is enabling lot of things and thought uh, uh, in a cloud when we build like clusters uh, with these things so yeah i will get back to you uh, jo thank you looking forward to that yeah thank you very much thank yeah you. Uh, thank you uh, professor abi uh, oje uh, uh, you know professor abi has been very instrumental in uh, putting together that soc design curriculum uh, for the last 3 uh, months and we okay, made it happen good. yeah we made it happen you know as part of uh, india wide uh, uh, you know workshop you know really 400 people joined that workshop for two weeks so it was amazing you you you, you are aware of that you know we started with you know oh, yeah, yes. yeah so it went very well and you know that's why you know that's the reason we we have a lot of you know skills uh, right now uh, getting developed uh, in india uh, particularly you know on power based technologies and also uh, professor abi has been running a smile lab at, uh, at his institute for the last two years with the ac922 kind of systems so he is also potential you know the power 10 um, uh, you know user and probably you know innovator to on power 10 you know some of the solutions so thank you thank you uh, thank you abhi. thank, thank yeah. you professor abi and, and thanks ganesh again for the opportunity i think i'm way over my time but i'm happy to yeah i'm fine this is a discussion discussion group